This is Brad Keithley, Managing Director of Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. Welcome to the weekly top three, the top three things on our mind here at Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets for the week of November 26th, 2018. The weekly top three is a regular segment on the Michael Duke Show. I join Michael on the show each Tuesday morning from 6.20 to 7 a.m. for a discussion between the two of us about our three issues. The show broadcasts on Facebook Live and via streaming audio from the show's website weekdays from 6 to 8 a.m. We post the podcast of our discussion following the show on the Alaska for Sustainable Budgets Facebook, YouTube, and SoundCloud pages, and on my website at bgkeithley.com. You can find past episodes of the weekly top three also at the same locations. Keep in mind that in addition to these podcasts, during the week, you also can follow and participate in the discussion with us of these and other issues affecting Alaska's fiscal and economic condition by following us on the Alaska for Sustainable Budgets Facebook page and through our posts on Twitter. This week, we start with a brief discussion of a couple of things that occurred Monday. Governor Walker's final draft budget and Governor-elect Dunleavy's announcement of his selection for OMB director. And then we turn to the weekly top three. This week, those are these. First, why taking excess dollars from the permanent fund earnings reserve account dollars above what is needed to fund Hammond 5050, is in fact a PFD cut. Second, our view of Frank Murkowski's new LNG option. It's not favorable. And third, we ask the question whether we are headed to a partial federal government shutdown as a result of a standoff between President Trump and Congress. And now, let's join Michael. Well, every Tuesday, We get a chance to sit down and uh, talk with my buddy, Brad Keithley, who is with uh, Alaskans for Sustainable Budget. He's a former oil and gas consultant, attorney, um, you know, does, uh, you know, has a side gig, economic. I mean, guys, he does a little bit of everything. He dabbles in a lot of stuff, uh, but he is the go-to guy that I like to talk to about uh, things when it comes to state business and budgets and more. He joins us this morning. And we are uh, we're going to jump into his weekly top three. But Brad, before we do that, uh, any comment on one, the governor's hubris of going out and throwing a budget out there about two hundred and thirty million dollars more than last year, uh, and trying to lay it at the feet of Governor Elect Dunleavy, and any thoughts on his new OMB director before we jump into the weekly top three? So let's do the first one first. Um, the the Alaska statutes require that the governor submit a budget to the legislature by December 15th. And it's been the tradition since that statute has existed when we have a transition year between an outgoing and an incoming governor, that the outgoing governor will prepare a budget, um, will go through that because you gotta begin this stuff in the fall, uh, begin the process, prepare a budget, um, and, and hand that budget over essentially in draft when when his successor takes office the first Monday in December. Uh, because the gap between, because the time period between that first Monday in December, in which this year is the third, and the 15th, the statutory deadline is short, traditionally the incoming governor has just submitted that budget but made clear that it's the, it's the budget prepared by the outgoing governor, that the incoming governor has the right to amend it and intends to do so. Uh, and get a revised budget to the legislature in the following January uh, or early February, I think, is the statutory deadline to have the revisions in. Right. So it's not surprising that Governor Walker has prepared a draft budget, um, and it's not surprising that uh, that he, you know, it was his last effort to try to get across his points. But but it, it's dead on arrival. I mean. The budget, um, he calls it a balanced budget, but it's balanced only because he once again cuts the PFD um, uh, this this time by about $1,300, um, transfers a bunch of that over to uh, the revenue side, and, uh, and then says it's balanced. Basically, what he's done in this budget is treat the PFD as the fudge factor, right? You do the spending you want to do, you look at the other revenues you're going to have, 
Uh, and you were right to point out that those revenues appear to be generous based upon the oil price they're using. Um, and then you, and what he's done is he's essentially taking the PFD or the, the draw from the permanent fund earnings and said, okay, I need this much to close the gap, to call it balanced, and then the rest will be the drips and bread, drabs left over will be the PFD this year. So it's, uh, Dunleavy, I was having a conversation last night, and Dan Sullivan, former mayor Dan Sullivan, popped up and said, you know, governors, some governors in the past uh, haven't even done, haven't even taken uh, that draft and submitted it on December 15th. They've submitted a budget that has $1 per um, uh, per uh, spending category and submitted that as their budget to make clear they're not adopting the outgoing governor's budget. I'm not sure that's responsible, but but it but I, it, it's fairly clear this budget's DOA and it was you know statutorily required, so it's Walker's last gasp to get something out there. Right, absolutely. His uh, OMB director. Uh, I'm looking at the pedigree. I'm looking at the track record. Kind of liking what I'm seeing here. Any thoughts before we move on? Yeah, I'll, uh, I'll I'll say this. She certainly does have a strong pedigree. Her her track record though is not spending a lot of time in in any given location. I think right. she lasted a year in California, um, and and it's caused some controversy wherever she's gone in. I'll say one other thing. The firm she's coming from, the economic consulting firm that has Arthur Laffer and Stephen Moore in it, Stephen Moore has has not been a supporter of the PFD. Stephen Moore. Uh, has uh, has on occasion said, you know, he views the PFD as welfare. It's more the John Hoghill and Pete Kelly approach, right? He views the he views the PFD as welfare, and uh, and certainly supports uh, uh, using it to support governments in lieu of having uh, income taxes. It's going to be important in this administration administration that people stay in their lanes, uh, and by that I mean that the OM direct, OMB director focuses on. Uh, cutting costs, focuses on the spending side, and doesn't get into issues about about the PFD because the history of that consulting firm is not give, does not give you wide uh, 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 a, a, a cozy feeling about right, right. Uh, about the PFD. So if she it, it, it's important that she will stay in her lane. Uh, she she does have the reputation of being a hatchet lady. That's going to be great. It's going to be fun to see her and Tammy Wilson work together uh, uh, on on who can outdo the other in cutting the budget. But but I but I think like the Dunleavy uh, or like excuse me like the Walker budget is going to be sort of we're going to get a rush of that activity from her and then she's going to be you know moving on to other things and then and then it's going to be up to Tammy uh, and others in the administration to sort of you know implement that work that she's going to be identifying. Well, let's jump into the weekly top three then, uh, since you mentioned the PFD, because uh, y- you've got some discussion on the new ERA draw, looking at the numbers, the 50-50, uh, where does it go? Is it really, uh, a- a- you know, what is the real return rate and and what happens? You're saying this could be a thinly disguised PFD cut. Let's talk about that. So here here's the here's the issue I'm concerned about. I The... the the, the PFD is, or the, the the permanent fund is set up to treat every generation uh, fairly, right? Right. Uh, and and one way you do that, and we do it through earnings, but you can do it. You can also do it through a POMV if you if you do the POMV right. One way you do that is to make sure each generation only takes um, the return, the average, the long term average return that's been generated by the permanent fund over time. Takes no more than that. If each generation takes that, then each subsequent generation uh, can take the same. And just to put some numbers to it, let's assume the permanent fund value we're dealing with is, is $60 billion. And let's assume that the uh, that the long-term real rate of return is 6%. That's $3.6 billion a year. Uh, half of that, using 50-50, half of that $1.8 billion would go uh, to the PFD. If you do it that way, if you take that long-term real rate of return, uh, over time, each generation is going to get is going to get that 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 sort of return, that sort of equivalent of 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 1.8 billion dollars for for the PFD. It will grow with inflation. Uh, the real rate of return is is after inflation. It'll grow with inflation. But if you start overtaking, if any generation starts overtaking the PF, uh, overtaking uh, their share of the earnings reserve or their share of the permanent fund which is a concern coming up in this legislature. 
then that generation is going to get more and leave the next generation with less. So, for example, if we if we take our sixty billion dollar um, uh, starting point, and and if this generation would just take six percent of that, uh, then there then everybody every generation is going to be able to get six percent, assuming the long term real rate of return stays at six percent. But if this if this generation takes ten percent, uh, it takes the six billion for takes a six percent for uh, 50 50 uh, government and and the perm and the PFD but takes four percent more draws into uh, draws out of the earnings reserve four percent more to cover spending to cover current spending uses it as a, as a fiscal reserve then then the, the the amount goes from 60 billion left in the in the permanent fund goes from 60 billion down to 55 billion and six percent on that for subsequent generations is about 150 million dollars less than this generation took for themselves. Right. So uh, the concern is not the concern is not using the earnings reserve and not using the you know the the historic earnings approach or using a POMV approach that reflects the long term real rate of return. That's that's all well and good. That's what each generation should do. My concern as we come into into this coming session is going further than that and this generation Going using the earnings reserve, this nineteen billion dollars that that Governor Elect Dunleavy talks about, this nineteen billion dollars as a as another fiscal reserve, and starts using that to cover current spending. If we go over the six percent and they take that additional amount, that excess amount, uh, to cover uh, additional spending, then that's really that's going to be effectively a PFD cut for future generations because it's going to leave a lower permanent fund value, a lower investment base. Uh, that future generations are going to be drawing or are, are going to be earning on and drawing from. So that's that's my concern. If if we overtake the if 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 this if this generation this coming legislature uses the permanent fund earnings reserve as a fiscal reserve and and overtakes their six percent our six percent that we're entitled to the long term real rate of return and takes another five billion dollars for example to cover current spending. Um, then that's effectively a PFD cut for future generations. That's that's a point I'm going to be coming back to often uh, in this in this session, I believe, uh, because I think we're going to have a problem um, uh, in this session getting the spending down to the level uh, that it needs to be down to to stay within current revenues plus a 50/50 draw. Um, and I think there's going to be a lot of pressure from from legislators. Uh, and for and from various special interests to say, well, let's just let's just pull a little bit more out of the earnings reserve uh, to cover to cover a spending shortfall. It'll be okay. Right. We're just going to pull a little bit out We're, this year and then next year. And and and, I, and, and, and the point I want to keep making about that is that's a that's a long term PFD cut uh, that we'll be doing if we do that. Okay, and so people, so people are clear on this. We're talking about the earnings reserve, but in, in for the purposes of this discussion, the earnings reserve is technically part of that sixty billion dollars uh, of the permanent fund. I mean, we have the corpus of the fund, which is constitutionally protected, but then you have the earnings reserve account where the excess earnings of the fund go. But when they say sixty billion dollars, they are bundling the two together. Uh, even though one is constitutionally protected and one can get just a draw from the legislature on a uh, on a majority vote, but it, technically between those two things, that is the that the entirety of the permanent fund. So what you're saying is, if they drew another five billion dollars out uh, beyond the six percent rate of return, then what you would have is you'd have a five billion dollars less in basically the permanent fund overall. And and that's why it would then generate a lower return going forward because there's less principal when it's all said and done. Am I am I kind yep. of summating got, that correctly? Got, exactly right. That whole sixty billion dollars, the portion that is in the corpus and the portion that's in the earnings reserve is invested. Uh, that whole sixty billion dollars is invested by the permanent fund, and it produces the returns. That investment base is what produces the returns uh, that that we look to uh, to fund. Uh, uh, the PFD and the fund government going forward. If you reduce that investment base uh, by overtaking out of the earnings reserve, if you reduce that uh, investment base, the earnings that the that the permanent fund is going to generate is going to be less uh, because you got a lower investment base. So, 
that that's exactly right. The sixty billion dollars is a combination of uh, the corpus and the uh, and the the build up earnings reserve. So we got to watch out for that because again, if we spend too much of the earnings reserve, it is a permanent cut to the permanent fund uh, until they would refill it. But that's money we're never going to get back in that regard. Uh, my other question before I let you go, and and we're going to run a minute long here or so, but um, is my my question is on the percentage. You're you're saying you're using the hypothetical six percent return, which is I think is pretty conservative. I've seen numbers that some funds have used up to eight percent. Um, my concern is is that they may monkey with that number, you know, consistently. They may come back to it over and over and over again and try and play the game. And I know one of the things we've talked about in the past is that there needs to be some stability in that number, and it needs to err on the side of being as low as possible and still generate a reasonable return. Is am I, is my concern justified? It is. It is. The six percent is. You can look at the history of the fund. It's had some years when it's earned a lot more, some years when it's earned a lot less. But sort of regardless of whatever time period you use, 25 years, 20 years, 10 years, 15 years, 5 years, the average earnings over, over that sort of period has been around 6%. That's, that's that after, after inflation. That's, that's been the historical average. If you take – if instead of taking 6%, you take 5%, which is what SB26 would do, Actually, you're shorting the current generation because you're taking less. You're taking less than their fair share, and you're transferring that additional percent to the benefit of the future generation. So, it is. It's important that percentage is important, and I use six percent because that's the historic realized uh, uh, real rate of return that the, that the funds generated. Okay, we are back in the break. Um... And Brad Keithley continues with us now during the thing. This is the special stuff that all you guys in the Facebook chat room uh, get uh, get to continue with us here. Karen asks in the chat room, does the 6% six, uh, 6 POMV still allow for a full PFD based on statute? Uh, it does. Um, and and you can you can do the numbers. You can see the, the earnings. The earnings are the real rate of return <laughs> over time. So if you used a PFD based upon the current statute, uh, you'll have some differences in any, in any given year, but the average over time will be, uh, will be roughly the same. Um, William says, and I haven't read the whole thing, so I'm just going to read it out loud to you here, Brad. I've read the beginning of it. Mixing the concepts of one, the historical PFD distributions, with two, rebating unpaid portions of the same historic PFD distributions for the past three years does not equate to meaning the current generation will curtail the benefits of future generation. It means that the current generation will get what it should have received per the historic statute, which is still in the books. Granted, if the cap PFDs are not rebated, future generations could receive more, but that does not mean that if the PFDs are rebated, then future generations would receive less than they would have been entitled to receive based on this historic formula. The only way your concern would become true is if the new PFD POMV formula would be based upon a 6% draw of 50-50. That's why I still advocate for the original historic pfd formula yeah that's a i mean it it, it it's it, what what, you, what that argument essentially is is that the current earn investment base shouldn't be 60 billion dollars it should be 50 55 billion dollars to start with and that um uh we the, the that five billion dollars difference it's actually two and a half but for the purposes of this example i've used in five that that five billion dollars um, is is somehow um, uh, artificially in the investment base and should be taken out uh, to begin with. I, th there's a long argument about that. Uh, I don't think that's accurate. I think that five billion that what what the PFD cuts that we've uh, experienced over the last three years were in fact taxes that paid for a portion of the overspending uh, that uh, uh, that occurred uh, during that period. And I don't think it's right to rebate those taxes that were paid and just say this entire amount of overspending gets kicked to the, gets kicked to the future. Uh, but I, you know, I, I understand, uh, 
uh, uh, technically the argument that, that, that that's being made. It's just I, I just don't agree with it. Well, and I think, again, that just for clarification for folks out there listening, uh, you know, there is the historic PFD payout formula, and then there's the historic, uh, P, you know, permanent fund, uh, the P, POMV versus the valuation uh, formula uh, as well. So we've got we actually got two separate things we're talking about here. Uh, I don't want people to get confused. Uh, on on what what is happening here, uh, based on what you're seeing right now, uh, some of the cabinet positions, some of the discussions, some of the players that are moving in. What are your thoughts on moving forward here in the next two minutes? What are your thoughts on uh, the discussion and the and the promises that Governor Dunleavy has made about uh, paying the full PFD? Um, discussions about whether it could pay the back PFD. And, uh, you know, what it's going to do with budgets and, and the government moving forward based on the personnel and everything you're seeing right now. It's all going to depend. The ability to pay the, to pay the full PFD is all going to depend on bringing spending down. If we can't bring spending down, um, paying the full PFD on top of that. Uh, is is going to – well, if we can't bring spending down, we we, we can't afford uh, to pay the full PFD. We, 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 we're going to have to – we're going to have to tax something uh, to pay for the excess spending. Um, and if you look at the legislature, the reality is they're going to vote to cut the PFD. I mean, you got Chris Birch out there and others, Natasha von Imhoff, uh, saying that they will vote to cut the PFD before they institute – any sort of taxes. So um, we've, it all depends on bringing spending down. The cabinet that the, the governor-elect Dunleavy is bringing in looks like uh, that they're, uh, they're, they have the ability to identify uh, spending reductions. The selection of the OMB director certainly uh, goes in that direction. Goes in that direction. But here's going to be the here's going to be where the rubber meets the road. You go in. Somebody's going to go in and say we're going to cut Medicaid. Uh, we're going to cut all the optional Medicaid services in, and essentially cut Medicaid in half. We're going to close two of the universities. We're going to go to one university, um, and then you're going to get the pushback. Uh, the people who are on Medicaid are going to push back. Their legislators are going to push back. They're going to be calling legislators. People at the universities are going to be calling. Um, and can the legislature withstand that sort of pushback? Uh, that's that's where the rubber is going to meet the road. Um if they can, uh, I think I think the Dunleavy administration will identify where those cuts can be made. Um, if they can withstand the pushback, uh, then we're gonna then we're gonna be fine. If they can't withstand the pushback, and either push back in the in the legislative session, the regular session, to have a higher budget, or if Dunleavy then comes in and exercises vetoes, okay, the, the, the le legislature is going to have to resist calls for uh, uh, for uh, uh, overriding. Brad Keithley is our guest. Our weekly top three, we were just talking about the PFD. Time to move on to our second of the three top three, and that is Frank Murkowski's proposal for an alternative to the Alaska LNG project, which essentially uh, res revolves around uh, moving uh, up to the Arctic uh, and uh, getting uh, uh, LNG icebreakers and doing other things, taking cues from Russia and others, instead of building an overland route. Uh, which, again, it, it has some pluses, but it definitely has some minuses for people inside the state of Alaska for that. Brad, what are your thoughts? Well, uh, Governor Murkowski, for those who haven't seen it, Governor Murkowski wrote an op-ed that's in the Alaska Journal of Commerce, may show up in other places, that essentially said it's time to consider an alternative uh, to, the <coughs> to the proposed LNG project. Um, and the alternative is as you just described, to build a short pipeline, uh, or, or perhaps not even to build a pipeline, but to, uh, but to trench out, uh, dredge out a, a channel uh, up in the Beaufort Sea uh, to, to create an opportunity for icebreakers to come out of uh, North Alaska, uh, uh, the North Slope, uh, and bring uh, ice or bring LNG down to ADAC. And then on ADAC, you would have a bunch of storage tanks and um, and and you would use those storage tanks to uh, uh, disperse LNG uh, to various markets and to store LNG delivered during the summer when the tankers were able to get out um, and use it and then bleed it out, bleed that LNG out in the winter. 
Um, this isn't this isn't an, a new concept. It's a it's a concept that sort of reemerged as a result of what Russia is doing over on its side. Uh, but it's not a new concept, and it's been penciled out before. It was it was part of the evaluation that was done at the time that the producer group uh, came forward with the with the Overland LNG um, uh, proposal. And and because of the capital costs, I mean the the the, the current LNG proposal has a has a big capital cost because you have to build a pipeline and and uh, and and it, between the treatment plant and the uh, uh, and the gasification uh, plant, um, but but the capital costs involved in building and buying and leasing uh, these icebreakers um, is is ever bit as and, and the time involved then of having to ship them down ship that down to ADAC and the costs involved of building the facilities on ADAC is <coughs> excuse me historically as big as the capital costs involved with the pipeline you still have to build a treatment plant on the north slope you still have to build a gasification plant um, uh, all you cut out is the cost of the pipeline and the cost of building these icebreakers and the adac facilities um, uh, sort of off is, is sort of the same <coughs> so all you get out of this all you get out of this proposal the Burkowski proposal the only benefit you get out of that uh, is that the dollars that otherwise would go to build the pipeline go into these other ancillary facilities, and they go to the benefit of people who build those other ancillary facilities. What you lose is is the benefit of having gas for Alaskans uh, by building a pipeline through Alaska and the benefit of property taxes uh, being generated off that for the benefit of the state and the local communities uh, as that pipeline uh, goes through Alaska. Essentially, what you're doing is you're transferring those state benefits of gas for Alaskans uh, and, and property taxes and other revenue generation inside the state. You're, you're transferring those benefits to the individuals or the, or the business groups that will own the tankers uh, and own the facilities in ADAC. Um, and it's not – so – so what you're doing is you're, is, you're, is you're taking benefits that otherwise would derive to the state and to the people of the state, and you're transferring it into private hands. I understand why they're proposing this. I mean, for the investors in that project, that'd be a great deal. Right. Uh, they, they get they get you know the profits off of running the tankers and and or the LNG tankers and and running the facilities at ADAC and 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 sort of derive those benefits to themselves. But for the state, uh, it's not. Uh, a great deal. It, right. it, it, it loses those benefits that the in-state pipeline has. Well, and especially access to the resource in the form of utilities and everything else. I mean, I'll be honest with you. When I moved south from the interior, um, I, I mean, I saved, you know, like $5,000 the first eight months in utilities. I mean, it was a significant change for our family. Uh, and that had all had to do because then I had access to uh, utilities that utilize natural gas instead of heating oil. Uh, if all the people in the interior, in Ninana, up and down the highway system, uh, all these other places had access to it, it would have a huge effect. The trickle-down effect of that is just amazing. Uh, so not just the jobs, not just the taxes, but even just the access to our own resource would be a huge benefit. And if we did that with the, with, with, with the tankers, it would change that whole picture. Yeah. The, the frustration, I mean, what they're, what they're trying to leverage up is the frustration of, of the line sort of being stalled right now. But the line's being stalled because of the Chinese trade war. If we, I mean, we were, we were on track to get this deal put together before the trade war broke out. Uh, China wanted to, wanted to help with the balance of payments. This, uh, the LNG project would be a big chunk of helping with the balance of payments. We were on track to get that going. The trade war broke out, and it sort of, it sort of stalled the current, uh, the current situation. But the tanker, the tank approach, isn't any better. I mean, we are stalled out because of the trade war, and the tanker approach would be stalled out similarly because of the trade war. So they're trying to leverage up. Uh, they're trying to leverage up on on the dissatisfaction of. of of the of the uh, of the frustration of where we are right now, and say, well, this alternative would be would be better. Yeah, it'd be better for some individuals that you know position themselves to get the the economic benefits of the tanker and ADAC, uh, but it wouldn't be better for the state overall, and it's not going to go any quicker. 
than the than the current uh, current plan we're on. We got about three uh, about two and a half minutes here, uh, Brad, to see if we can squeeze in the final of your top three, which is, of course, uh, what I mentioned earlier: the potential for government shutdown. Uh, it's supposed to be happening this Friday uh, if they don't pass some stuff. What's happening? Well, it's a week from Friday. So a week got, from Friday. Got, I'm sorry. Yeah. They got, they got two weeks to get it done, December 7th. Um, ironic date. Yeah. <laughs> um, but it's, it, and, and it would be a partial government shutdown. We funded before the legislators went on their pre election break, before Congress went on its pre election break, it funded a number of, of, of government functions. So it would only relate to those government functions that have yet, uh, that have not yet been funded. That's about 30% of the remaining. Uh, budget, if I recall correctly, we funded uh, defense before they went on break, and we defunded we funded uh, large portions of the uh, non-defense uh, discretionary budget. Uh, but we still got homeland security and a couple of other things. The president, <coughs> excuse me, the president has uh, threatened that if he doesn't get funding for his border wall, and I think the number he wants is five billion dollars, if he doesn't get funding for the border wall, he won't sign. The appropriations bill, uh, and if you don't sign the appropriations bill, if you don't get the appropriations bill enacted, then then those functions of government covered by the appropriations bill don't have funding, uh, and they and they have to start the the shutdown process. Um, and so it's going to come down to a standoff between uh, the 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 president uh, on one side saying I want full full what he calls full funding for the border wall this 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 piece of it, full funding for the border wall. And, um, and and Congress, mostly Democrats, but some Republicans as well, saying uh, that it's not it's not reasonable to, to put that level of funding in the, in, in this bill. Uh, I think they've offered a billion and a half. Um, it'll be a political standoff, uh, right. but it very well could have the effect uh, of shutting down uh, parts of government as we head into the Christmas season. Uh, one of the uh, 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 Agencies affected would be Homeland Security. TSA uh, is in Homeland Security. <laughs> oh man, it's it's gonna it's gonna be a mess. That's that's for sure. All righty, Brad, you want to finish up your thought uh, in more complete uh, terms there on the uh, on what's happening with that uh, potential shutdown and what do you think uh, overall is going to happen? I think I think the I think the uh, uh, the session that we're coming uh, the the uh, uh, lame duck session that we're coming up on. It's going to be more, more fireworks than I think we anticipated. Yesterday, uh, the chairman of House Ways and Means uh, introduced a 220-page uh, tax bill uh, that cuts even more taxes. I mean, there's no price put on it, uh, so, so it's problematic in that regard. But it's an additional, an additional tax cut that that he says he's going to run through committee this week. And, and in fact, the full House may vote on by the end of the week uh, and try to create leverage by having a tax bill sitting out there uh, on the House side. Um, and I think that will just raise the hackles of the Democrats uh, even more if the Republicans are trying to push through in this lame duck session uh, stuff that they want to get done before the before the new Congress takes over. And so I think that it'll put the Demo make the Democrats less likely to. Uh, negotiate uh, on other things than than they otherwise might be. So I think we're going to see some fireworks uh, out of this lame duck se session, and it very well may result in uh, uh, a partial shutdown uh, for at least a portion of the time. Now there are ways that you that that you can get around the effects of a partial shutdown. The president has the authority to declare certain parts of government emergency, uh, uh, need, absolute needed uh, for emergency situations. And can, and can declare an emergency that would keep them funded on a contingency budget, uh, even while uh, the rest of the department is shut down. So he could do that with uh, TSA. He could do it with ICE and with other things inside Homeland Security. But but we're we're going to have a lot of politics uh, rolling around yeah. uh, in, in the next few days, and uh, uh, as we lead up to December seventh, and and after potentially after December seventh, and and I you know. I'm not sure where it's going to end, but it's something. It's something that we need to we need to be aware of. The irony of this whole situation, of course, is every time there's a shutdown, it's not like anybody really loses any money because even though all those people get furloughed, 
uh, it's generally speaking about ninety percent of them get all their they get paid. It's like a paid yep. vacation. They yep. go they're off for ten days or five days or fifteen days, and yet they get a paycheck when it's all said and done for all the time they took off, as if they went to work and worked all day. Um, well, and, and and the work doesn't get done, so you lose efficiency. I mean, it actually costs more money to shut down the government uh, than it does to uh, uh, than than what it's what you gain from you know going through all these political machinations, but. Sometimes people want to play, use this as an opportunity for a political game. So right, well, and just you'd think with shutdown, you think, oh, we're saving money. It's shut down. No, we're we're not. We're not saving saving any money. Uh, one final thought before I let you go. We're about uh, four and a half minutes out. So um, uh, there was a couple of more announcements in some of the governor's new staff, including um, he's picked up Amy Dabosky. What, mm-hmm. what? Any thoughts on that as a as the deputy chief of staff? Well. And, and I think that's a great thing because Amy is a Amy's a conservative. She she goes in with the attitude of a cost cutter of being a cost cutter. In her response, we're going to have do, two deputy chiefs of staffs. Uh, her responsibility appears to be uh, over uh, over the budget uh, uh, and the budget process and 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 spending and and that sort of side, as opposed to operations where the other deputy chief of staff will sort of. And so I think that's really good on that on that part. It'll be another person inside the administration who's a strong supporter uh, of a full PFD, and I think that'll that'll be very good. Um, but it's important. I think that just raises again the importance of people staying in their lanes. Uh, as I say, the history of our of our new OMB director, uh, the history of that of that of the people in that firm is to you know view the PFD as a as a welfare check, um, and. And that's going to be that's going to be problematic if she tries to bring that over to, you know, starts talking about that inside the administration. So right. I think Amy's a very good, a very good addition. I think that brings another strong voice for uh, for fiscal uh, sa- sanity uh, into the administration. And, and I and I applaud the governor for making that appointment. I just see again, I see Adeween, uh Tammy Wilson, Amy Dabosky. There's a lot of voices in there for for a tighter, smaller more fiscally responsible government. I kind of, kind of got a grin on my face right now. Kind of <laughs> feeling a little good about it. It's like all my Christmas wishes might be coming true. Um, you know, if is if as you said, everybody could stay in their lane and we could stay on board. Um, I'm getting a little concerned with some of the other names that are being named simply because there looks like, again, speaking of political machinations, there's some political uh, stuff going on behind the scenes, which is it's politics. I guess. What are you going to do? But we'll be watching. We're going to be watching and we hope to see some changes. Any final thoughts here, Brad? Uh, well, one uh, minute on, on that. The legis- legislators have to man up. I mean, I, that, that may not be an appropriate comment anymore, many more politically correct comment. But but basically, legislators have to man up. Right. They have to. The administration can propose all these cuts. The, the, the legislature has to make them. Um, and then even if they don't and the governor vetoes, they have to stand behind the governor uh, on when, when people try to you know overturn the veto. So uh, it's we can we can add a lot of people in the administration and we're adding the right direction. Uh, but the legislators, particularly the Senate, uh, is going to have to man up and stand behind uh, stand behind the, the, the things that the, that the administration is going to be doing. Yep. Well, I'm with you on that. Brad Keithley, Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. Links are up at the top of the Facebook page right now if you want to see it. Brad, thank you, my friend. As always, it's good to uh, it's good to talk with you. Michael, thanks for having me, as always. Well, that's a wrap for another week's edition of the Weekly Top 3 from Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. Thank you again for joining us. Remember that you can find past episodes on our YouTube and SoundCloud pages, And keep track of us during the week on Facebook and Twitter. This has been Brad Keithley, Managing Director of Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. We look forward to you joining us again next week on the Weekly Top 3.